and then go back to this. Um, you you want to have an introductory? Want to start straight away? <laughs> a short one, maybe. Just I don't know who is in because I can't see the participants. But, uh, okay, then. Uh, Hello uh, in real life and also the virtual audience and today we have Albert who uh, everyone knows as uh, usually one of the organizers and often chairing uh, the colloquium. We are happy to go back to real life. I think in this year is one of the few talks yet that we had in real life, but for the future we want to do it as often as possible if the speaker agrees to. And let me uh, very briefly introduce Albert. So Albert has amazing German skills. At least I could not find any flaws yet, but I will test them further. <laughs> and um, yeah, so he did his uh, PhD at a Buazici University, and he helped me also to to learn. Uh, uh, how to um, and uh, that is in Istanbul, right? Yes. And he was at different stations in um, in uh, the Netherlands, CWI, and uh, also Amsterdam. He was also for one year at the Nagoya, Nagoya University. Nagoya, <laughs> Nagoya University. And without further ado, I give you the word. Thank you. But um, I think the people on the virtual um, they OK, they, I need to swap this place. And that should work. Yes. Well, in that case, you look at the. So how do I how do we That's do okay. I think it's OK for us, right? Um, why can't you see the. Yeah, what? This is, yeah, but this is this is really weird for me. Be, just a second. Oh. But you want to see the people. So speak. no, no, the, that the, that's not the problem. I don't want the notes to be on the on the slides. Oh. For some reason. Just a second uh, while we're fixing the this weird situation. Um, file. Save as. I will just save it as a PDF, and that will solve the problem. Okay. And then, uh, where did it save? Bilic abi el versen Sure. Okay. PDF. Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. And then view full screen mode. Okay. All right. I think I think we're good to go. Yeah. So this is what you see. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, so thank you very much, everyone. Um, today's talk is on data collaboratives and big data for social good, and. Uh, I usually start my presentations with this couple of slides where I describe what human behavior analysis means for um, uh, for computers, where we sense human behavior uh, with real world behavior or digital world behavior, and then we um, combine some theory driven or statistic or data driven methods to analyze the behavior and then feed it into applications. Um, and then I talk about um, the different levels of human behavior analysis. And in our group, we basically tackle all these three levels. We look at individual behaviors like facial expressions, speech, um, you know, um, Ronald works on deception detection, for example. Hey Sam works on apparent personality recognition, uh, sentiment and emotion analysis. We also look at uh, interactions between people. So small groups of people, can we understand their behaviors, turn-taking, mimicry, rapport. But then um, with Bill Gecha, who is also here, uh, we look at a larger scale of human behavior, which is what we call also computational social science. Um, and there we look at maybe thousands of or millions of people at the same time, and we observe their behavior through different channels. Uh, in, in, in most cases, some big data source um, and of the digital breadcrumbs they leave behind when um, they um, go about their day daily lives. Um, and in, in this kind of setting, we have two challenges. One of them is a technical challenge. How do you interpret the complex human behavior? 
and you use AI techniques and big data sources, data science, you know, you, you make them serve your uh, specific problem. But there we also have some humanity challenges, right? So what are the social implications, ethical considerations in the deployment and widespread use of these tools? And uh, because we live in a surveillance society where governments have extraordinary power to learn about what humans are doing, and corporations have extraordinary power about um, human behavior as well. And they also swap data and you know sell data behind our backs. So there's a lot, lot of information going around. So it's important to, for us to understand, first of all, what can we learn with these data sources? And then if we decide that something is really uh, not to our liking, how do we prevent these powerful corporations, governments, institutions to, um, to misuse our, our data. Um, this is closely linked to the sustainable development goals, and I will talk especially about um, refugees and migration uh, um, settings, and that's, uh, that's related to one of the uh, SDGs in, in, in particular. Um, reduced inequalities, for example, is very important, but um, you will see that uh, artificial intelligence can actually serve each of these SDGs at different levels. So this was a, a McKinsey report, which is uh, quite recent, looking at 160 case studies distributed among these domains to, to see whether artificial intelligence can be used for social good. And they found a lot of applications. For example, if you look at health and hunger, one of the biggest categories, you can see that AI techniques can be used for mental wellness for treatment and long-term care, prediction, prevention, and treatment delivery. These are all things that we're looking at uh, in our group. But um, if you look here, crisis response, disease outbreak, migration crises, natural and man-made disasters, search and rescue, these are also uh, application areas which can use big data. Now, uh, this is an Intel report um, showing us what are the ingredients for our, uh, for an AI for social good application. Well, you start obviously with a problem to solve, like you know you want to improve the water quality, you want to track endangered species, or you want to help refugees on their journeys. Um, and then you usually need some partners, right? You cannot solve this issue as a computer scientist in front of your computer. Typically, you need to first understand the problem space very well, Typically, there's a, there are technical and conceptual issues you need to know about, so you get some partners. Then you search for data, and often the, some of this data will be held by private companies. So data might be difficult to, to reach. Some of it will be available on the internet. You will crawl YouTube, uh, Twitter, you know, Facebook. Sometimes uh, these data sets will, will help you. Um, once you get the data, you would look for some computing power because we're typically talking about a large scale problem here. You develop your algorithms, you test, and then the critical part is you want some real world deployment, right? You have created a technology, then you want it to deploy it, and then all of a sudden all the human factors will be inside this issue. So whatever you create, for example, you create an application which allows people to send money to refugees in a refugee camp. You may completely destroy the economical ecosystem of that refugee camp by activating such a technology. You don't know about it. You have to really talk to people on the floor, on the ground, um, and do some qualitative studies to really understand the implications of your technology. And one problem is that we as computer scientists are very very bad in understanding the implications of the technologies that we develop. We don't get educated for that in particular. So I'm a, I'm a staunch defender of ethics courses, applied ethics education for all computer scientists, because, you know, the people who developed Twitter, they could not have anticipated the filter bubbles, right? You know, the echo chambers. It's very difficult to foresee what's going to happen with the technology. So you have to monitor and you have to think about the societal implications of technology all the time. For academia, well, there are some issues. This is um, uh, from a workshop uh, conducted in Europe's in 
2019 about AI for social good. Um, and the, uh, the problems that they identified, well, the research community does not have enough incentives for social good applications. Um, the deployed systems often produce negative consequences, like the examples I gave. Uh, and then there is little consensus for public policy what is good, right? For example, if you are a, a rightist government, let's say, admitting more refugees to your country may be a bad outcome. Whereas if you're a humanitarian organization, that could be a good outcome. So good and bad depend a little bit on, on what kind of perspective that you take. And often we adopt normative uh, perspectives. We think, you know, what we call good is good for everyone, which may not be the case. Um, and again, that requires us to work with social scientists because they have a much broader conceptual tool work to deal with these kind of issues. Um, further problems, so these are my additions to the list. Most data are proprietary and difficult to take out of companies. And I will give you examples from the mobile telecom data. Uh, academics are typically focused on one aspect of the problem, but when you come to do policy, uh, I'm okay, I'm exempting the academics who work on policy, but um, for computer scientists, we usually are very reductionistic in our uh, approaches. We say, okay, this is our loss function, let's optimize our system to care for the loss function. But when you do policy, you have to take into account really a huge number of things, most of which are not quantifiable. So they, you cannot put them into your loss function easily. That's, that's uh, very tricky. And then there are no easy mechanisms to convert academic results into policy and applications because we don't regularly talk to the ministers. Maybe we should, uh, you know, talk to them and then we should also speak their language a little bit. You know, we should not talk about loss functions or Pareto fronts or anything like that. So data collaboratives is a concept that can help us in our way. It's a cooperation between private and public sectors in the field of data sharing and statistics. What does it mean? Suppose the telecom, telecom operator has a lot of data and they want to do some public good with it. They go to the Ministry of Health and they say, look, you want to battle COVID? I have a lot of data. I can actually help you with this contact tracing issue that you want to implement. Let's collaborate. So the uh, company, the private partner, opens uh, a data set to the public partner uh, under certain conditions. So it has to be, of course, done carefully. And then they collaborate to achieve some social good. And one way of doing that is a data challenge. Because if, um, let's say, um, the telco company in the Netherlands come to us in Utrecht University and says, OK, I have some data. Can you help us you know, um, with this COVID contact tracing situation? Can we develop something? Um, then my research group would be, for example, the only group would be the only group looking at the data. But if you do a data challenge, maybe hundreds of research groups can look at the data. So once you take all the pains of anonymizing and aggregating and preparing the data, then why not let a larger number of people look at it? That will also give you verification of the results because more than one research group can actually run the codes and test some algorithms. Uh, and it is related, so this kind of public good perspective is related to a question of applied ethics. What should one do in a situation, right? So as computer scientists, if we have the power, the capability to help, for example, the refugees, wouldn't that also entail some responsibility? Shouldn't we also do something about it, right? So um, instead of, I don't know, using my computers to mine Bitcoin, I can maybe do some um, algorithm that will benefit these these people. So, OK, let me skip this one. And uh, the sources of private data, well, um, mobile phone data is the one I'm going to talk about, but big data comes in different flavors. You have now satellite images looking at the world, and you can do a lot with that. Social media content, very rich, different social media give you different types of information. For example, you can learn a lot about skilled migration from LinkedIn, and you can learn about, about uh, a lot about sentiments against migrants and refugees from Twitter or, and Facebook. Right? Um, infrastructure usage is important. For example, in the Netherlands, the Dutch railways uh, have a lot of data about 
which cities are connected to which other cities, how many people are traveling back and forth every day. Um, online gaming is also a very, very nice uh, um, data source. Um, you know, people have tried modeling epidemics using World of Warcraft because that included a lot of um, lifelike simulation of uh, human behavior and epidemic transmission could be could be um, simulated on top of that uh, game. OK, so I will focus on mobile phone information and there are three ways you can get mobile phone data. One of them is you can uh, use an application on the phone and uh, to interact with a system. For example, I have the Corona check application on my phone and the government collects data from that application. Every person who's using the application is providing the data. The problem is, of course, unless the government dictates it, your coverage will not be full, right? So some people will have the application, some people won't. The second thing uh, would be to get information from an application on the phone directly, not just the usage, but you know, you, you let the people give you information through the application. And then the third one is you go to the telecom company and then get data from them. OK, so that because they need to reach all your, their customers, they have to know where their customers are at all times. And that's an information that you could perhaps get from them under certain situations and um, provisions. So this whole thing, um, using the phones for human behavior analysis kind of started or got accelerated uh, by a study by uh, Eagle and Pentland called Eigen Behaviors. They distributed 100 smartphones, well, smart at the time, smartphones to uh, people at MIT. And then by looking at very simple things, you know, call logs, Bluetooth devices in proximity, cell tower IDs, application usage, and phone status, they were able to learn a lot of things about the people. Okay? For example, they were able to say whether you were likely to be a business school student or a senior student or a first year student, because depending on what group you belong, your behavior changed, right? I mean, uh, the computer science students were always at the lab. The business students uh, were, you know, having fun. That's, that, I'm not making this up, right? It's in the paper, you can go and check. Uh, but what they were doing was, you know, they were just taking all the um, measurements and they were doing PCA on it. So they were reducing uh, it to a dimensionality. They were finding the eigenvectors, which, you know, explain the variance in the behavior. And they called this eigenbehavior. So that was an interesting uh, methodology. And it was also a little bit spooky about, you know, you, you see how much information can be gleaned just from your, you know, whether your mobile phone is open and at what time is it open and closed. And then from that time onwards, we had a bunch of large scale data sets on smartphone data. Um, also, as the phones became smarter, the, the, the sensors on them became also much richer. So a typical smartphone that you and I all have may have 15, 16 different sensors on them. Accelerometer, gyroscopes, location sensors, all kinds of things. Uh, and then that, of course, uh, gives a lot of information. Mobile call data records or call detail records, they are a, a different kind of beast. This is not a, a, a data set that um, ordinary people can have access to. These are records that exist in the phone company for accounting purposes. Every time someone makes a phone call, it's recorded. Which base tower called which other base tower? Which number called which other number? What was the duration? And what, who were the people in the call? Okay, because you have the numbers, you can also link this to identities. At least the telco can does it. So the advantage is if you can get a, a CDR data set is it's a comprehensive data set. If the telco is a monopoly, you can get all the people in a country, which is huge. In some countries, the mobile penetration rate will be low. In poor countries, there your coverage will be smaller. You don't need explicit consent from people if you're going to process this kind of data at the level where you're not processing personal information. Because typically, you give this consent when you sign uh, your agreement with the telco. When you buy your phone line, you also give them permission to process your data in an anonymized, aggregated way. 
In some countries, it's even um, harder than that. Uh, some countries, uh, uh, the government can legally read the data, right? For example, in Israel, the government can ask, okay, Till is a suspected person. Tell me where he has been in the past six months. And he can get this from the telco, uh, uh, you know, charted out. Every time Till's phone went, the government will know about this. And that's legal, it's in the law, so it's possible. Um, not quite in the Netherlands and also not in Turkey, at least not in legally, but I, I shall not say too much about what's happening behind the scenes. So the disadvantage is the, the data is very difficult to obtain, sensitive, can lead to massive surveillance, consent is difficult if you need to obtain it, and it needs to be processed. Okay, here's an example, all right, so it's rows and rows of these um, records of, you know, at this time, this phone number called that phone number for 500 milliseconds or 500 seconds, so on and so forth. So these were the geographical areas, you know, the base tower locations. Um, the first big CDR data set that was made public was in 2011, collected from Ivory Coast after the civil war in, in Ivory Coast. And the aim, so this was a cooperation with the government of Ivory Coast, and the aim was to improve the welfare of the country. It was in ruins after the civil war. Um, so the data set was uh, basically a call to scientists to come up with innovative ideas to improve the country, the infrastructure, the technology, and everything. Uh, it was successful. Then uh, another um, data for development challenge was organized in Senegal. Then uh, Telecom Italia, Telefonica challenges. Uh, then I organized one in Turkey, the data for refugees challenge about the Syrian refugees in Turkey in 2018. And at the moment, we have the Hummingbird project at Utrecht University. We're leading the mobile uh, package where, again, we study uh, Turkish um, telecom data with Bilgecha. Uh, but now we're studying migration. So we're trying to develop migration indicators. Um, in the interest of time, I will skip the data for development challenge. Uh, but I will show you how we aggregate and anonymize the data. Suppose your data contains a particular cell phone making four phone calls next to these um, cell towers. And if you treat uh, the nearest cell tower, it, it will create a Voronoi tessellation for you. So you will basically know that the person is within uh, a cell, but not uh, anything further. So you will not know the exact location of the person. Um, so what we do for aggregation is we just report the number of people, for example, calling within a cell for, a, for an hour, okay? And if we find that the cell is too small, where in city centers sometimes you have a lot of, um, ooh, okay. No, no, it's just, I think it was not charging. Um, so if the cells are too small and you think the data is too sensitive, you can, you know, combine a multiple cells or you can say, okay, my temporal resolution will be two hours. So this is what we offered uh, the, to the participants in the Data for Refugees Challenge. Cell tower locations, site-to-site -site antenna traffic on an hourly basis. So this antenna has so many calls to that antenna for, it, for each hour for the entire year. And then fine-grained and coarse-grained mobility of a small set of anonymized users. Okay, the fine-grained mobility is at cell tower level, but we track people for only 15 days and no personal information is included. So it's just a, a phone line. Of course, the number is also not given. Um, and the coarse grain mobility is tracking some people for the entire duration, but then you give at the prefecture level. So it's a much coarser level. Um, we prioritized five areas, safety, security, health, education, unemployment, and social integration. And we asked the challenge participants to create projects that will help the refugees in these areas. Okay, so um, the ethics issues are obviously important, right? So a special ethics commission was formed. They screened all the project proposals. They decided who's gonna get the data. They also screened all the project reports and decided what needs to be modified before publishing. For example, 
one project finds that um, refugees are working at the third airport site. It's, you know, it's a large construction site and you see refugee activity there. Ah, by the way, we also tagged every uh, CDR record with a refugee tag. So we know whether it comes from a refugee or not, because we know whether they have uh, registered with a Syrian passport or bought a cheaper refugee tariff and things like that. Um, so, but if, if, the, if people know that the refugees are working in, in an area where they're not supposed to work, you know, the opposition can, you know, make a big deal out of it and these people might lose their jobs. So we adopted a principle we call do no harm and we prevented any result from um, being published if there is a slight chance even of harming the refugees. Um, okay, so there, were, there was a strict legal agreement like a, you know, um, to, co to protect data confidentiality and privacy um, and every uh, group had to apply with a research proposal. So we, we had some safeguards there. And uh, projects with commercial or military interests uh, were denied. They, they did not get the data. Um, OK, so these are the key ethics issues here. OK, you have to have the consent of the people and data sharing must be permitted by the owners. Um, in, in, in this particular case, the telco agreement agrees, uh, includes a, a statement that this data can be used anonymously for research purposes. So that's everything you need. Um, protection is no individuals should be able to uh, be, could be able to track or identify with this data. And that's a very important uh, condition. UNHCR said, if you want us on, in the project, you have to ensure that no individual can be tracked with the data that you're sharing, which we uh, satisfied and they joined the project. Um, limited use of data, retention, destruction and archiving, that's important. So after the challenge is over, you have a grace period and everybody has to destroy their copy of the data. They cannot continue publishing on the data. Um, no personal information, no profiling, clear legal agreement, and then one thing is very important, data protection by design and default means as we create the data set, we anonymize it. OK, so once we take the data out of the telco, it's already anonymized in one way. Uh, and it, you cannot go back because the original data is destroyed. So the telco kept, keeps the data for one year, but we initiate the challenge one year after the data collection. So the original is not there anymore. And there's no way that you can decouple the aggregated data. And there's no blanket agreement. OK, so what did people do with this kind of data? Well, first of all, you can obviously model mobility. You can find from which cities or which areas to which areas people are moving. So you can create these origin destination matrices and visualizations. You can look at the mobility of seasonal workers. For example, in Turkey, there's a hazelnut harvest and refugees are given a blanket uh, work uh, permit to work on the hazelnut harvest. By the way, 4 million Syrian refugees and only 60,000 working permits were issued. So there's a lot of illegal work. Uh, unemployment and work is, is a major area of study. And we know that they will come to work in the hazelnut harvest, but we don't know from which cities they will come, how many people will come, where will they stay? When will they go back? And if you know these things, you can create policies. You know, you can send some educational or health resources that way so that to prepare for the coming refugees. If you know whether they're coming with their kids or not, that you can, you know, that you can prepare for that. You can say, okay, here's a mobile health center. Here's a mobile education center that people can use while they're here. And with this data, actually, you can see where they are coming from and how much they are staying and where they are staying. Uh, that is uh, the, the, the nice thing about this kind of data. Um, this is a collaboration between uh, Sabanja and MIT universities um, about developing social integration indicators. So for example, for every city, you can look at the locations in which refugees and non-refugees come together and how many of these locations are there, right? So if there are, for example, public places where these two groups of people are coming together, that helps the integration. Are they coming together? I mean, the mobile phone information 
also tells you that. Uh, and you also know whether refugees in a city are calling other refugees more or local people more and vice versa. So all of these things can help you to build social integration indicators and basically create a map of the country saying these parts of the country are good in social integration, these parts are bad. You can also perhaps evaluate some interventions the government does to improve the social integration in a certain area. For example, if we have, let's say, festivals for getting you know, people together, do they really help? You don't know, but you can measure this quantitatively. Access to healthcare. So this was a, um, um, a project by the Turkish counterpart of the Red Cross where they visualize the density of uh, refugees in Istanbul. So you can see the colors noting the number of refugee residents. So the red areas are where refugees are most uh, concentrated on. And the red dots you see are the mobile health centers with Arabic translators that the government has uh, created to help the refugees. So you can see, for example, that there here is an area with a mobile health center but uh, there are not many re refugees around that area. And here are some areas with no mobile health center, but a lot of refugees. Now, if we were um, just, you know, computer scientists doing the optimization, we would, you know, take this mobile center and put it over here. But as I said before, policy doesn't work that way, right? Because, you know, that you also have people working in this mobile health center and you don't know where they live. So if they live around here, you know, moving this center here might make their lives much more difficult, right? So there are a bunch of other issues you need to take into account when you want to translate this simple optimization into an actual policy decision. Modeling epidemics. So this was prior to uh, COVID, but um, um, especially with measles, uh, most Turkish people were vaccinated, but most Syrians were not. So um, um, a group in Italy simulated what happens if a measles epidemic breaks out in a city? And then you, you know, you simulate this, you know, with an agent model that includes both refugees and non-refugees. And then they were able to show that for cities in which the social integration is good, the epidemic was much slower in, because people would protect, you know, the vaccinated uh, locals would act as a shield, whereas, um, for uh, for groups in which uh, the vaccination rate was overall vaccination rate was low the epidemic grew very quickly and it became much difficult to to control so one solution is to improve integration in certain areas actually okay traffic analysis mobility on special days distribution of agricultural products what do people do in emergencies like floods and earthquakes energy consumption Communities and community detection, all of these things you can, maybe you cannot do this entirely alone from the mobile data, but by combining the mobile data with additional data sources, you can do that. This is an uh, older work by one of my master's students, uh, Didam, uh, about the data for uh, development challenge, detecting anomalous events uh, with a simple Markov Poisson process so, for example, here you see the a base station and the mobile phone activity on a particular base station. It's like a heartbeat, right? So there are moments in which the, um, the activity level will be low, and that a little bit depends on how that particular area is used. If it's an entertainment area, you will see activity in the late hours. If it's a work area or an urban area, then, uh, you know, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., there will be no activity. But this is like a pulse. You can see the activities on the subsequent days and then you have these peaks. What's happening in those peaks, right? There's something going on um, in the so around the base station. People have started calling each other like crazy. So in, in this particular case, somebody shot someone on the street because this is the Ivory Coast data and it's still the civil war. Um, but if you see this uh, activity across the country, uh, where, what something we see in Senegal, for example, sometimes it's the Senegal football team scoring a goal in the World Cup, right? So you can actually um, try to couple this with social media data to really interpret what's going on. And you can create a system that will give you anomalies. Okay, uh, we collected all the reports of the challenge in a book, uh, Guide to Mobile Data Analytics 
in refugee scenarios. Um, and we also try to include a chapter about policy. So, um, you know, a lot of people came together. We discussed how can we help policymakers in this. Um, there are a lot of ethical and legal concerns, obviously, when you want to do data science for large scale mobility analysis. And uh, this is um, um, this is a um, new publication. Uh, we're, we're publishing a book from um, Oxford University Press on data science for migration and mobility. And there we have a chapter on on this particular topic on ethical and legal concerns written with a, a penal law expert and an ethics expert. Um, of course, one aspect of it is bias, right? So if you, for example, analyze the data and then you decide, oh, the refugees are creating a lot of crime in this area, okay? Um, that, by the way, this is a topic that has been analyzed several times and it has been shown multiple times that refugees typically do not lead to increased crime rates. But of course, your algorithms may be biased. Maybe you, you modeled it poorly and then you, you have a, a, a possibility of harming people. So you have to be uh, very careful in this kind of uh, analysis. Um, I'll not talk about the bias in AI, but um, this question whether tracking people uh, actually can be beneficial for them has been asked repeatedly. And my answer to this question is yes, you can help them, but you have to be careful about it. Uh, so we are developing um, in the project and with our collaborations methods and uh, policies and good practices to uh, ethically do this and help people. Uh, one example is uh, mobile phones versus COVID. So at the beginning uh, of the pandemic, uh, we came together and uh, charted out how mobile phone information can be used for COVID. And there are a lot of things you can do with it. You can improve situational awareness. You can um, kind of understand what's going on uh, at real time. You can do predictive analysis. You can do cause and effect studies, and you can also try to assess the impact. For example, uh, you know, different uh, population groups, how much are they moving? Are they moving? And it's very important to really interpret the results carefully, right? So uh, in, in Turkey, for example, uh, a newspaper published um, an article at the time saying, oh, this is Istanbul, and these are the areas in which people are still going out of their houses despite all the quarantines. We recommend them to stay home. And these are the areas in which people are, you know, behaving nicely and they don't leave their homes. Uh, but actual, uh, you know, if, if a social scientist looks at it, they will say, oh, the rich areas are the areas in which people can afford not to go out of their houses and they have a reduced mobility. The other ones are the, the workers that have to go to, to win their daily bread. So they have to go out. So the way you interpret the data actually typically needs social scientists and insights. And that's why this is a very interdisciplinary field uh, which you know, prompts a lot of collaborations. The Hummingbird project is about migration, understanding and improving the migration flows. And uh, we also have mobile CDR analysis. Now we're looking at people who disappear from the data set without churning to a different operator, right? people who have left the country, basically. Um, maybe they are, you know, visiting some other country for six months, but maybe they will come back. But uh, the nice thing about computational social science is that you can also work with a lot of noisy data. Because your data volume will be very, very large, you can still find correlations and patterns. Um, this was an interesting um, case study we did about the opening of the Turkish border in March 2020, when Erdogan said, I'm opening the border, so let the Syrians flow to Europe and kind of threatened Europe at the time. And then two days afterwards, you know, went onto the uh, television and said hundreds of thousands passed into Greece and, uh, and Bulgaria. And we can actually see in the data how many people passed, right? So it's kind of, um, you know, it, sometimes it's really useful to, to observe the data to, you know, as a, as a sanity check, but of course you can, uh, build models of move mobility, migration. You can link this to theories like gravity and right radiation models. Um, you can derive indicators that will serve these models. Let me stop here and uh, take some questions.
Yes, please. No, I'll repeat the question. Don't worry. Yeah, so the question is, how do we prove that someone cannot be identified in the data? Um, sometimes that's pretty straightforward. So if there is a base station, let's say around Utrecht University, and I tell you that between 11 and 12, there are 55 people making phone calls. How are you going to identify anyone with this kind of data? It, you know, it's, it's trivial. But there are cases in which you can combine different sources to identify, to narrow down the possibility. So for the fine grained mobility, let's say I take uh, someone's phone line. OK, it's the number is changed. You have you get a pseudo random number at user five. I tell you that user five was making a phone call in Utrecht in the morning. OK, and then in the afternoon, he or she is in Groningen. And then at night, he or she is in Nijmegen. OK, so now you have a tracklet. If you know if you're tracking a specific person, then um, you can try to match that person to to this particular phone line. OK, um, and then you can narrow it down. And if you have um, eliminated enough people from your data set, then you can close in on a specific person. But in this case, we do not have a closed data set, first of all. We don't have all the people in the country. Uh, the telecom has only 35% coverage, so we only have part of the people. Plus, we only have uh, people for a randomly selected 15-day period. So if you're tracking a specific person, there will be no guarantee that that person will be in the data set for that period. And then you cannot do elimination because not, it's not a closed set anymore. So you cannot say um, this must be the guy I'm looking for because that's the only guy that fits the specification because maybe that guy is using another phone operator or you know, or he or she is not in that particular 15 minute, 15 day sample. We take only a very small sample, by the way. Um, I would like to have a question, but yeah, so. Evante. Yeah, so the question is, what is the exact process? Where do the questions start? Does it start with the policymakers or does it start with the computer people? And this goes back to this dichotomy of theory driven and data driven uh, analysis. So if we take the data and say, OK, what are the clusters in the data? OK, what are the interesting patterns? Can we detect anomalies? That's the data driven uh, approach. Um, and but if, if you ask questions like, OK, can we find moments in which people um, will migrate, for example, can we determine or can we predict what are the factors that that's going to drive this kind of behavior? Um, and can we verify whether this mathematical model or that mathematical model fits better the behavior of the people in the country? Then the question comes from the from the social scientists that work with the theoretical part. Uh, in most cases, it's a mixture of both, because once you see a weird pattern, then you will look for what could explain it and you will actually look for theories. And if you have a theory, you first will have to look for some data that will kind of give you a confirmation of your theory. So you, we will have some confirmation bias, but that's not always a bad thing, right? If you have no empirical uh, hunch whatsoever, how would you come up with a theory, right? So, for example, uh, in one of our collaborations, 
um, the doctors who were working with Alzheimer patients came to us with a hunch. They said, we have a hunch that Alzheimer patients look younger than their age. So we built a face analysis system, age estimation system, and we had a, a, you know, a, an Alzheimer group and a control group that matched them in their age. And then we, we, we gave these, the data to the computer and uh, we did a statistical testing to show that indeed the Alzheimer patients looked younger. Now, the next step is to ask why, right? Is it the medicines that they are using? Is it um, the, you know, the kind of lack of emotional responses? Or what is it that makes them look younger? Is maybe they, you know, they stay, stay indoors more so that they have less wrinkles because they are less exposed to sunlight? There, it can be any number of things. So then this, you know, the, the scientists that work with this have to come up with hypotheses and then we have to find ways of falsifying them. Yeah. So where do policymakers fit in is the question. And 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 uh, well, policy itself is is a is a is a big beast. I mean, I've I've I'm I'm not an expert in this. I try to understand a little bit how how what kind of methodologies are there. Um, but depending on which area where you're doing the policy, it's a matter of combining qualitative and quantitative insights. That's the most important thing. Some things you will you will be able to quantify. Some things you will be able to quantify with biases and errors that you can roughly guess. And some things are extremely difficult to rank or quantify. Yeah, well. They have to be if they are good policymakers, yes. Uh, but then it's a com it's a weighted summation, right? Sometimes it's driven by certain things that are, you know. Also, it's it relates to power and it relates to money, so it's a it's a different beast altogether. Yes, we can. Yes. <laughs> are there any questions from the audience? I don't know. I I can't see it. Let me stop sharing and have a look at what's going on here. In the chat, I can see something. Ah, this is this was in the beginning, though. Hi, Shaq. I think you're. Are you? Yeah, you're. Can we hear him, though? Uh, can oh, you yes. hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Awesome. Okay, great. Uh, Albert, my compliments for your uh, talk and especially also for uh, the extent of your work and uh, bringing uh, society into our uh, classrooms and uh, research uh, projects. Um, my, uh, first of all, uh, I'm uh, a remark. Uh, I'm very glad with your plea for um, uh, ethical uh, education of, of our students, uh, uh, expose our students to ethical uh, issues re uh, related to computer science. I can um, uh, thank you for that. Uh, we uh, do have a master course on ethics and this is uh, called uh, responsible software or responsible ICT, sorry. And that is taught by Sergio uh, Espana and Jens Gulden. And uh, so uh, uh, it would be good if uh, also the students from the, let's say, the masters, uh, computer science, uh, GMT, data science, etc., could also, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, join this course or uh, that uh, insights from uh, the uh, researchers from uh, those uh, domains uh, uh, contribute to this uh, course. So that's uh, that's a remark. Maybe you, you can comment on that. Yeah, um, I think um, it's a good idea to also to to look for because you know applied ethics is is distributed to our curriculum. I mean, many of the courses. Uh, devote some some time to talk about ethics in their own specific uh, <coughs> subject matter. For example, in social computing, we start off by reading an ethics paper, um, and then we we time and again come to this topic. But in other courses as well. But I think it's it will be useful to look at it kind of like a holistically. So in our programs, how how much of it do we teach? Where do we teach them? 
and is there something we can improve there? So I will I will work on this in the coming in coming months. I will uh, basically ping everyone about what kind of ethical material they have in their courses, and I will try to bring this together in a report to the department. Okay, great. My second question is related to uh, theory building in your field of human uh, behavior analysis, because when you, let's say, from an, uh, would uh, listen to your um, uh, presentation from an, say, outside of you, you could also say, well, that uh, Albert Sala is the head of the uh, uh, the European uh, UN um, HCR. Uh, the uh, IT division, uh, because the way you presented it, it was very much focused on on system building, on algorithm testing, on presenting results. And so my uh, question is, where is the theory building in um, be, be made explicit in uh, so that in th this is about large scale human behavior anal analysis huh? and yeah I, I i do not see the snippets uh, of of, the, of theory uh, and and this is often the um uh let's say the comments uh, we get uh, in in reviews when we submit proposals to the nwo en uh, uh, panel from physics and, and uh, uh, biology, uh, that uh, we are considered to serve as the, the programmers of science and not as a separate uh, theory development uh, discipline. Can you comment on that? Well, I showed you uh, behavior at different scales and theories do exist, but they also exist at different scales. So at the level of migration, you have, for example, the gravity model, which looks at something very simple, actually, right? You know, a bunch of factors, but they, it, it needs to be all encompassing. But it's a theory of, uh, of a social science. So it's, it's not like a mathematical theory. It's, you know, we, we call both of them theories, but they're, I, they're, not, they're not the same. So I agree, but, but isn't there a case, computer science example, theory about... It, this yeah. field. Um, I don't think this is a question that I will be able to answer in a, in a very short time frame. <laughs> um, but of course, um, for addressing a very specific problem, if the existing theories f fall short, that's where we where we do our theory building. And that requires different types of expertise because the theories belong to different domains. So if you're working on a on, on computer vision, for example, and you're applying a machine learning tool, then that's the level where your theories might be helpful to you. It's, you know, so you talk about mathematical models that advanced your uh, theoretical knowledge, and that can be applied to other domains as well. Um, but this is very much an applied uh, part of science. I, I agree with that. I do not, I don't, um, <laughs> I don't consider this to be bad. Let me stop here because uh, Till is urging us to, to finish. It's only four minutes to five. Thank you very much for the questions. And uh, thank, thank you all for being here. I'll stop the recording. Okay.